channel. It's Memorial Day weekend. I have got my barbecue propane, but instead of barbecue, we're gonna use it to start a Maribara 4200 Atlas motor. Okay guys, this is very exciting. We have our 4200 Atlas Maribara up on the engine stand. We're gonna start this baby up. Even more importantly, this is my very first propane motor. We have our barbecue propane from the store. We have a distributor conversion and we have this propane stuff up here. Let's make some noise. Allen head cap screw, metric. And we're going to bolt on this propane mixer. And that has an O-ring in it, so seals up nicely. Okay, that's plugging up the distributor. There it is there. And we'll put him there. So now Everything's quarter inch flare, so I can use the service lines on it. Sweet. Okay, hey, turn that on. We got gas. Two more. But now we need to talk to Jerry about what makes propane actually work. Okay, I'm here with Jerry. Jerry, I've never run a motor on propane, so talk to me a little bit about how these things work and how they're different than a traditional like gas carburetor. Okay, uh, the carburetor in this case is called a mixer, and it's going to mix instead of a, a liquid with the air, incoming air, it's going to mix the incoming air with the gas. The gas is provided by this converter. The gas comes as a liquid into the bottom of the converter, is essentially reduced in pressure, and in so doing gives absorbs heat, comes to the second part of the regulator, that's communicated to the mixer, and when the mixer demands gas, it provides it. So in our tank, the, the propane tank that we go get from the store for, right. our, for our barbecue, it's stored as a liquid, correct? Right, it's a liquid under pressure. Okay. In fact, it's a good refrigerant. Excellent. So, whatever the vapor pressure in the tank is is proportional to the temperature. Okay. So, if you raise the temperature, the pressure goes up. And if you lower the pressure, the temperature goes down. So, the tank will get cold if you take the gas out and it boils. The liquid will boil and it'll absorb heat. Okay. Same so thing happens here. And when that does that, you have to provide heat. Okay, so we're feeding the liquid propane from the tank into this. Correct. Then we're also adding um, hot water essentially from our cooling system. That's correct. Right, that's correct. So that we can heat that up, right? That's right. You want to provide heat, it's called the heat of vaporization. Okay. And you have to provide that or it'll all get very cold and stop. Okay. And then that's actually what makes this work, right? Because we've got to True. change the temperature of the propane. Right. You have changed either the temperature and pressure both change. They're, okay. they're interacting. Okay. You, you change one, you got to change the other. Okay, so right. then now how does it know how to inject that propane? Okay, inside there's a diaphragm in the mixer, and when you open the throttle, it sees the difference in pressure between outside and the manifold, and as soon as it sees that change, it communicates it by the drop in pressure, and this provides fuel to make up for that difference. Great. So one, one of the things about this is it'll track the atmospheric pressure, and it'll also track boost pressure. Which I see, I've read a lot of books on Ack Miller and all the stuff that he did, and he was yes. always a big proponent of running propane with boost. Right, it, because the atmospheric pressure doesn't provide as much air that you could squeeze a little bit and put it in there, 
Worked very well with And it. so if with propane, we don't really have to have like we do with a gas carburetor. We don't have to have a dedicated blow-through carburetor. Essentially, because this is tracking, it already is kind of a blow-through carburetor, right? Right. That's what Essentially, that's what this is doing, is it's looking at the inlet pressure, looking at the demand, and telling this, provide that much. It, know, it knows how much is coming in. It's got a pitot tube in the front of it. Yep. And it, it senses both the static pressure and the pressure being driven in if you force air into it. Communicates that to the, the regulator, and the regulator's got a lot of area, so it's very, very sensitive to those changes. Nice. If you blow I, on it, it provides fuel. I've had people tell me that this is like a mechanical mass air meter. <laughs> it is. In fact, uh, it's very much like the original fuel injection on the Volkswagen that pulled the needles out of the hole. Oh, yeah. Right? Same idea. Excellent. Now, let's talk about one of the reasons why, obviously, because this already works under a blow-through application, but the other great thing that I've been told about this is that the propane has higher octane than your 91 regular pump gas, so that makes it also beneficial for turbocharging and supercharging. Correct. Yes. Uh, the 110 octane allows you to run more boost than you would normally run on pump gas. Nice. But, but as you were telling me, intercooling is still necessary with this. Right. Because one of the reasons it's probably always good to intercool is that um, you don't know where the transition between uh, detonation and not detonation because you don't know the purity of the fuel. It's not like gasoline. It's not controlled. It's supposed to be better than 95% propane, but there again, it can be adulterated a little bit, and you don't know that until you have trouble with it. That's only when you're at the limits. However. So did I read that with the liquid propane, they're adding things like butane and other things to this? Well, there's residual when the refining process takes place that those are very close together. One boils a little lower than the other. And so there's always some mixed in. Okay. Well, this is good stuff. I, I'm really excited about maybe trying one of these things. And the thing that I like about this is like on this application where we did the start of this motor, right. this is obviously a fuel injected motor. Right. This intake manifold is designed to flow air or get, or and not liquid fuel, and we're essentially not doing that with this carburetor, right, or this mixer. Yeah, the engine thinks it's all air. So this is coming in in a gaseous form into the intake manifold. So theoretically, I would think distribution for this type of manifold would be better with propane, right? Right, no maldistribution if it's all gas. That is excellent. I can't wait to try one of these things. I may, may want to borrow one of these for the dyno so we can run this thing. And then we can also run that thing under boost, yeah, right? If you want to throw a turbo on it, it you'll be pleased. I, I ran an engine very similar size, the Oldsmobile Aluminum V8 in a Vega for about 10 years. Nice. And uh, I loved it. It was, you know, good, good performer. So you're a proponent of propane because, not because of what we just saw here, being able to start something on the engine stand is fairly simple, but you've driven around with these a lot, right? Right, I had a um, 73 GMC with a 454. Um, I wore out two engines in it. <laughs> nice. You know, and they didn't, they didn't wear out the bores or anything. Uh, at about 150,000, the cams began to go flat, but the cylinder bores didn't wear at all because the lubrication stays in, it doesn't wash doesn't wash away the lubrication in the cylinder board. Nice, another benefit of propane, right? Okay, Jerry, one of the things I noticed about this motor, one of the things that allowed us to start this thing up on the stand was the fact that because we needed ignition, obviously, and fuel, we had this distributor on this motor. So if you can tell me a little bit about this distributor and what allowed this thing to run on a motor that didn't originally come with a distributor. Well, when I first got the engine, I didn't know how to run it. I didn't have a computer that went with it, and I didn't didn't know what to do about it, so I figured if uh, I could just kind of go backwards in time, I would either put a carburetor or, or um, a distributor on it, and I'd be able to, to run it, because uh, when I got it, I, it was before they were introduced, and I'd never seen one run before. Sure. So I happened to have this distributor. I got it from Stove Bolt, and it, it was made and modified by Tom Langdon to work in the GMC-6 and the Chevrolet-6. And I think he makes a whole series of them, and it's completely electronic. It's out of a, a Citation V6. Nice, so, the old Citation. Yeah. And um, all the electronics are self-contained. It's got a centrifugal advance and a vacuum advance, and it's got 20 in the centrifugal and 11 in the vacuum, and if you time it at 10 degrees 4, it should run. 
And it does. So all you had to do was hook up the coil wire and we, we had to put um, 12 that, volts to it? Well, I had to do a, a drive on it. And what I did is there's a sensor that goes to the cam. And since I wasn't going to use a phaser because I couldn't control it, I didn't have the computer. Okay. I simply put a gear on the end of the cam and one on the distributor. It's a right angle drive. Okay. And found top dead center, zeroed it up, and then then went to the propane carburetor because I didn't want to run wet because of the fuel injection. I didn't have a controller. So you got a carburetor, you got to have a distributor right. with it, right? I'm going to show you guys the phaser and the other gear that we use or that that uh, Jerry used to make this work, but. Getting rid of the cam phaser, not a problem, was a deal, and then hook this distributor up because you need spark and fuel to make this run. Okay, I'm here with Jerry. Jerry, one of the things I noticed when we started this thing up, running this thing on the engine on the engine stand was awesome. But when we started this thing up, I was taking a look at the oil pressure gauge. And this thing, like the motor that I ran on the engine dyno, has high oil pressure. Now everybody told me, look, your, your pressure relief is stuck. You have way too much oil pressure. It shouldn't be that high, but I noticed this thing also has similar oil pressure. So what's going on? Well, all the ones I've run into have high oil pressure. And uh, I had the same issue when I first started this. I looked at the oil pressure and I thought it was inordinate. And I thought it was too high at over hundred pounds. And so I called Tom Langdon at General Motors and asked him, and he said, uh, oh, I think there's probably a stuck relief valve in that engine. So I took it all apart and looked, and it wasn't stuck, and I put it all back together, and I went down to 530 oil, which is the recommended. Uh, I put 1030 in it because I figured if I used the engine in the valley here where the temperature's over 100 degrees, it wouldn't make much difference. But it did. So now it's got... 530 mobile one in it, but it still runs a hundred pounds cold when you start it and it falls off as you warm it up Sure, and I noticed that when we went up in rpm It's going quite a bit up over hundred just like mine did right and uh, I've I've seen on the internet people blow the filters up when they put them on the dyno and rack the throttle So I don't know how people are getting away Except that the engine eventually is going to wear some clearance into it, but sure, it's pretty tight from the start. Yeah, but temperature clearance we know is going to affect that. But one of the interesting things that you brought up is guys are looking at the gauge that they have in the vehicle, and what oil pressure are they reading from that gauge? Well, I think they're they're looking at a switch closure from everything I can do. I haven't actually dissected the sender, but the sender isn't sending what the real oil pressure is at all. I so it's a, not like a real transducer then? Well, I'm, I can't say for sure, but okay. I have a vehicle out back, and it's a 2007, and it says, uh, you know, 40 pounds or whatever the center of the gauge is, and it never changes. It's always there, and I know that's not what it is. Well, we saw this thing moving a lot when you just touched the throttle. So right. if, they, if the gauge there is not moving, is it more like the lights that we used to see I on these cars? Like an, I, think it's, I think it's kind of an idiot light disguised as a gauge. So it, it's either yes, it has oil pressure, or no, it doesn't. I believe that's it. All right, well, well if you take a look at that, I'm, I'm real curious to find out what you find out. Well, I was, one of the things I was going to do is place another gauge back in the back of the oil gallery and make sure that there's not anything funny going along here where the oil filter and the relief and all the other things are. Um, so we'll be able to find out if you do that. If whether there's a drop in oil pressure, oil, right? Oil, yeah, I want to see whether the oil, oil pressure is uniform through the whole engine. And that would be very important, right? Because yeah. we want well, oil pressure everywhere. Run it hard. It's very important. You don't want to spin a main in the back because you don't have oil pressure. That's awesome. We're testing oil pressure here. I can't wait to find out what he finds out. Okay, guys, what did we learn about our little adventure with our 4200 Amerabera? Well, we learned a couple things. First of all, these things have high oil pressure. You can put a distributor on these. You can put propane on these, but more importantly, you can combine all of these things together, run this baby up on the engine stand. I'm Richard Holder. Make sure to like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, do all that stuff. More and more testing coming up.